Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Bernard. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Osprey Informex. I wanted to welcome everyone to the first in a series of webinars about innovation in the oil and gas industry as well as other uh, heavy industries. So look for additional webinars uh, as we go forward from Osprey and, uh, and also working with Jeffrey Ken. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we'll be placing our microphones on mute, so please use the chat feature to submit questions during the presentation or for the Q&A session uh, at the end, and we'll, we'll handle questions after the presentation. We'll be presenting for approximately 30 minutes, uh, and that'll be followed by a Q&A. We'll, we'll let that run for, we'll see how many questions we can get through, but we should let that run for about 10 minutes. Uh, and on that note, um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Can. Jeffrey Can is an independent advisor to the oil and gas industry. Following an early career with Imperial Oil, he became a partner at Deloitte where he carried out hundreds of consulting assignments in Canada, the U.S., Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, China, Australia, and the Caribbean over a 30-year career. He specializes in digital innovation in oil and gas, lectures at the Haskane School of Business in Calgary, produces weekly article and podcast on digital issues in energy, and is writing a book on the impacts of digital on oil and gas to be published in early 2019. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey Cannon. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Jeremy, and I'm delighted to uh, be here today to share with you the uh, what's a f uh, in essence uh, some of the plot line of the book that I have prepared about the impact of digital on oil and gas. And I've entitled this presentation uh, "Bits, Bites, and Barrels." And first time in uh, the, and certainly in my career, I can see the intersection now of, of of the digital industry and the oil and gas industry coming together as a way of dealing with some of the industry's challenges. And uh, so, uh, without um, uh, uh, further ado, let's get into it. Um, just by way of background, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm a specialist there in this field, and um, so I see myself sitting at the intersection of uh, oil and gas and the, and the digital sectors, and I help organizations, oil and gas concerns specifically, understand the impact of digital innovation on their company and, and to help them uh, craft roadmaps and journey maps to be able to take advantage of digital innovation. Um, and uh, so that's my uh, my my uh, my storyline. Uh, one of the problems I find in industry, and specifically uh, this question of digital, is that m most organizations really struggle to try and even define what digital actually is. So the definition I like to use is the one from the International Energy Agency. The IEA um, is a, a think tank uh, based in Paris that publishes regularly on on uh, issues relevant to the energy sector. And their definition is that something that is digital. Uh, needs to combine three things, uh, uh, data, analytics, and connectivity. And I, I like to use my smartwatch uh, from Apple as an illustration of this. My watch and my smartphone are great examples of digital things. Uh, they contain data. So in the case of my phone, it's my address book. Maybe it's maps and my calendar. The analytics that it can do is to calculate the distance between two points on a map or maybe to um, uh, create a, do some uh, simple mathematics for me, like adding numbers together. And connectivity. I can. I, it's a cell phone. Obviously, has connectivity to the cell phone network, but also has Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, connectivity, Bluetooth, and so forth. So, a digital thing must um, re have some combination of these three things working together. And so that could include not just a thing like a watch or a, a valve, say, that has a digital sensor attached to it, but could also be a service. Um, so we think about cloud computing as an example of a service. It's a, but if you look at it more deeply, it, the servers that are in the cloud are really not that different from my watch. They also have data analytics and connectivity working in concert to create some new, what people would generally consider to be a digital thing. The reason why digital is so powerful um, is because of this thing called the network effect. Um, and as you add things in a, together in a network and let them communicate with each other, the number of pathways by which information can move and uh, between those nodes on that network um, goes up by a extraordinary amount. Um, sometimes we call this Moore's Law, which is the exponential growth rate of, of, of um, uh, the, the power of processing on chips. But the network effect is equally uh, powerful in that it is and defines the economic effect and the um, impact that multiple nodes on a, on a connected network can actually have. If you get up to 16 nodes, the math tells you that you end up with some two trillion, two trillion different ways that, that information can move around that network. And that's a, an extraordinary
extraordinary um, a, a number to, when you start to think about it, just 16 nodes. And so what happens when you connect up dozens and dozens of sensors, thousands and thousands of, of devices, millions and millions of phones? Uh, the connectivity effect goes up. And this explains why digital companies in California, um, I'm thinking here about Uber and Airbnb, why they uh, are so focused on building out their business models as quickly as possible. Because once you have trillions and trillions of connections, the barriers to others coming in and, and displacing your, your, your business uh, fade into the background. And so it's all about the network effect. Another question I frequently am asked is, well, what will digital do to oil and gas? And, and digital will impact uh, oil and gas along four vectors. And the first vector is it will increase supply. And by this, uh, uh, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, into specifically uh, shale reservoirs and tight uh, developments, tight resources, will expand the uh, volume of reserves. The IEA estimates for, uh, estimates, for example, that the expansion of reserves will be about 5%, which doesn't sound like very much. But it's 500 billion barrels of oil, and that is 13 years' supply at current consumption rates. And under Paris Climate Accord agreements, we cannot um, burn that petroleum and stay within the two-year threshold. And so, the, the, with the, all things being equal, if you push up supply, uh, then the price will go down. The second big vector is on the demand side. Um, what will happen to the demand for fossil fuels uh, over time? And, and there's a number of signposts out there that certainly suggest that um, the uh, shift in particularly transportation markets as we go to connected, shared, and autonomous, and ultimately electric cars, and trucks, and vessels, and trains, and so forth, will result in some form of demand destruction. No one really knows how much it's going to be, but the signposts are certainly there that the demand is, is going to be uh, certainly at risk. So we have these two vectors at pulling at either ends, and so for oil and gas concerns, energy companies, uh, the name of the game, therefore, is productivity and costs. We also can use digital to boost productivity of assets, people, and things, and reduce the cost of delivery of the, of the uh, services that are consumed by the industry as well as the product itself. Or to, to digital, it's not really talked about, but digital has huge impact on actually reducing climate effects because it allows us to reduce the consumption to the, r the right optimal level, and it can help us do things like detect when uh, there are emissions that we really don't want, like rogue emissions of methane, for instance. I think we'll touch on this a little bit later, actually. Yeah, absolutely. This is, a, this is one of those critical pieces of the puzzle, is that um, digital is one of the few things out there uh, that the oil and gas industry can do to mitigate three big issues um, uh, uh, quickly. One is it can improve our productivity, change our cost structure, and be used to offset or mitigate uh, climate concerns. So that's the impact of digital on oil and gas. Yeah, so uh, another question I'm frequently asked is, uh, how, how did all these pieces fit together? Well, digital is fundamentally a data game. It's all about data. And we've learned this from Facebook and Twitter and Google and, and Amazon and so forth, that the data asset itself is actually immensely valuable. Oil and gas concerns in particular sit on an ocean of data. We've been collecting it for years. Whether we analyze it or not is, is a good question. But there's ample resources of, of data assets out there. And as we add devices to the, our world, as the cost of sensors falls to near zero, um, we're going to be generating ever more data. So the Internet of Things, that's the addition of sensors to things out there, um, will create this, this new torrent of data coming at us. Fortunately, the volume is going to be so great, we can no longer really interpret um, that or ma manipulate that data with the legacy tools of the past. The old Excel models we've all grown very accustomed to are simply not up to the job. So this data will be generated by the Internet of Things, but it will be interpreted and analyzed by artificial intelligence. And from there, it will be consumed by robots. You can already see this taking place in uh, Fort McMurray with the automated heavy haulers that Suncor and CNRL are, are trialing. The haulers are robots. They're interpreting the data from the sensors, which is processed by artificial intelligence engines um, on, their, on the uh, vehicles themselves. Now, there's so much data coming at us, and these tools um, are becoming sizable in their own right. The only practical place where we're going to be able to house these is in cloud computing. So the next big layer of, of infrastructure is cloud computing. Most oil and gas companies still are a little skittish about cloud, but you know the, G, the um, Central Intelligence Agency in the United States has moved their entire computer infrastructure into the cloud. It's secure, it's safe, it's reliable, it has, shows infinite growth and, and good cost structures. So cloud computing is the next key piece. 
The next critical piece of the digital will be blockchain. Blockchain is what provides trust uh, over things like devices and sensors so that you know that they haven't been tampered with and that the data coming off of them hasn't been tampered with. Uh, blockchain will also provide the basis for people to purchase and consume a little piece of artificial intelligence. And blockchain is showing up in things like cars. Uh, Porsche has some trials underway where blockchain will be how Porsche will uh, provide a kind of agency to its vehicles where cars can pay for their own fuel, pay for their own parking, all recorded on blockchain. So blockchain will um, be this basis for creating new trust mechanisms. Underneath all of that, of course, will continue to be our legacy um, infrastructures uh, associated with enterprise resource systems. So um, products like SAP and Oracle are not going away. Uh, they are also shifting to digital structures and, and becoming um, actors in the cloud. And we can't do all of this stuff unless we think differently. Uh, Amazon, for instance, releases 170,000 software updates per year. Uh, in the time that we're even running this webinar, Amazon will have issued several hundred updates to their infrastructure worldwide. Most oil and gas companies struggle to get the updates out maybe one or two a week. So to be able to cope with the digital world, um, we will have to move to much more agile ways of working and thinking and with a specific shift on thinking about our technologies through the user experience. It's not an accident that Uber, uh, Airbnb, uh, Google, Search Engine do not provide training courses for how to use their technologies. They're so intuitive and easy to use, anyone can pick them up and run with them. And last but not least, and I put this at the top of this structure just to illustrate how, how important this is, um, digital is really a people problem. It's all about encouraging and getting over change management issues. That, that is not going away either. Um, and particularly in oil and gas, where certain business practices have been stable for 30, 40 years, uh, embracing digital really means placing a strong emphasis on encouraging uh, change management. Now, Jeremy, when we get into the later pieces of this, what I want to, to uh, the, the, everyone on the webinar to be thinking about is just have this picture in your mind. What, what uh, Osprey is going to show you is how using sensors, because the, the technology upcoming um, is a sensor type device that flows into an artificial intelligence engine and then automates certain tasks in a robot and sits in the cloud. It's a perfect illustration of this framework and how it hangs together. Last thing I wanted to just touch on was, was how do you get started? And this is a question I frequently get when I'm dealing with uh, executives in the oil and gas industry. They're being bombarded with pitches from consultants and uh, traditional hardware providers and um, uh, uh, technology companies and the media uh, all saying, hey, you guys need to go get digital. And of course, the question is, you know, well, what, what exactly does that mean? And uh, so here's a five-step program that I think most oil and gas companies can get their head around and, and uh, tackle. Number one is to set what I call that digital north star. And I'll use an example from uh, NAL here in Calgary. Um, the uh, CEO at, at NAL was on stage at the Petroleum Club a couple of weeks ago. And uh, when someone asked him, what is your, where's your digital north star? He said, oh, it's very simple. I want 100% of my wells running 100% of the time at 100% of their productivity level. And I want no people visiting those wells unnecessarily, period. And under today's world, he, we can't get there. We could get there with digital innovation, though. And so it, all of his energy and, and the investments in their organization will be aimed at achieving this digital vision. How do I get to this position where I can run my equipment basically remotely, almost robotically, from a distance, and do so at 100% of my performance parameters? Great digital North Star. Another digital North Star comes from the mining industry. A company in, in South Africa, Barrick Gold here in Canada, have said, we're going to open up an underground mine that has no people in it. Um, we're going to have to run the whole thing without uh, people. We can't hire the people. They don't exist in some of the places where we need to get access to resources. How are we going to do that? So they use digital to overcome those, those issues, create those robotics. Next step is to educate the organization. What I found is that uh, this is a big journey that, that people want to get on to, adopting digital. It can't just be done by one person. So you have to bring the organization along and educate the organization how to do this. Next is to build that digital uh, business-driven roadmap. Remember that the problem in oil and gas is supply up, um, productivity cost uh, can, can move with digital and, and the demand may, may be reduced. Um, every energy and digital innovation in a company in oil and gas needs to be taking aim at these vectors. So if you're in the upstream, your, your digital innovation could be in artificial intelligence to help improve your reservoir interpretation. But it could also be to improve the productivity of your wells and lower your costs. If you're doing anything else, it's probably a science project. And, and certainly in oil and gas, we don't have time for that. 
Number four is to liberate your data. Oil and gas is sitting on an ocean of data. Startups all around the world are desperate for data. Great, they have smart people with clever ideas, but they need data to prove out their ideas and make, make uh, create value. So creating values in digital means figuring out new ways to monetize data and liberate data so that startups can take advantage of it. And then last but not least, um, I advocate that uh, oil and gas industry that uh, companies engage with their broader community. Uh, the community includes um, startups, incubators, accelerators, venture capitalists, and so forth. That's where the innovation is happening most. It's out at the edge. And engaging with that broader community is critical to help bring some of those ideas uh, into your company. So with that, I'll uh, conclude, and now we'll turn to, and I, in a sort of really practical way, how could we visualize um, this combination of sensors, data, artificial intelligence, and robots to create value in oil and gas? Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And before uh, I give you a quick overview of, of Austrian Informatics and how we fit into some of Jeffrey's uh, frameworks, I just want to encourage people to submit any questions they may have for Jeffrey. Or, uh, or during the Osprey uh, phase of this presentation. Feel free to submit questions via the chat feature for Q&A, and uh, we'll go through those after the presentation. So on that, note, on that note, I'll give you a bit of information about Osprey Informatics. So fundamentally, uh, Osprey Informatics has, has used digital transformation to help oil and gas customers improve their operations through intelligent visual monitoring. And by improve, I mean reducing operating costs, and also mitigating safety uh, and environmental risks. So we see a huge opportunity uh, in oil and gas and other similar industries to apply intelligent visual data for automation. Uh, and what we mean by intelligent visual data, I'll get into this in a bit more detail in the next slide, but fundamentally taking images and video that is typically used in a security context and using it instead for operational benefits by applying artificial intelligence to it. So why is visual important? It's important because it's intuitive. This is how we like to consume information. This is how we learn most easily. It's insightful. So with modern technologies like artificial intelligence, you can, you can actually extract an extremely rich uh, amount of data from, uh, from images and video. And finally, it's contextual. So by combining visual data with non-visual data and correlating them, you can get a much uh, more accurate and much more a much broader view of your operations and respond more effectively to any alerts or alarms you may get from non-visual systems. And I'll give some examples of that during the presentation. So what's our product? It's called Osprey Reach. You know, and Jeffrey talked about a framework of IoT, artificial intelligence, and robotics or automation. We call that capture, analyze, deliver, but it really means the same thing. By capture, we're able to manage a very large number of visual sensors in the field, uh, keep these running even under difficult conditions in northern Alberta. Um, and once you do that, you're collecting a massive amount of visual data, but only 1% of 1% of 1% of that data is actually useful. Um, so what we do is we then analyze that data to look for specific things that our customers care about. And the way that we do that analysis is through a technology called computer vision the type of artificial intelligence that can recognize activity or objects within an image or a video. And then we can also combine that data with non-visual data. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, we can connect with enterprise data systems, SCADA systems, or other field sensors like an H2S sensor to combine that data with visual data so that when you get an alert from a system that is non-visual, you actually see what's going on because fundamentally that's what people want. Uh, and then on the deliver side, we allow our users, we recognize that we can deliver benefits to a wide range of users across the organization, not just about security and control centers. So we allow those customers to essentially tell our system uh, through a series of customizable alerts and reports what they care about, and we'll deliver only that information that's important to them so they can actually take action on it. And that's fundamentally different than what you see in a traditional video surveillance system. So we talked about IoT integration. Um, here you see an example of how a user can use our system to set up alerts for an H2S sensor and then have those alerts combined with visual information so you can see what's going on. That's just one example of that. We're also doing this with combining tank levels uh, and truck loading imagery. Um, so by combining those two things, you have a bigger picture of what's happening, and, and our system is designed to be very easy to integrate with these other third-party systems. I want to touch on some use cases. Jeffrey mentioned change management as one of the important things in digital innovation. 
and that's certainly one of the challenges that we've recognized as well. You know, you can have great technology, but unless it's practical, easy to use, and delivers value at the field level, uh, people aren't going to adopt it. So that's one of the things we've learned go as, as we've, we've deployed over the last five years with more than 30 oil and gas customers is you have to have practical solutions. So one of the practical solutions we've deployed is remotely inspecting uh, and monitoring uh, an oil well field. So allowing customers to use our system to go online and do simple and efficient online site inspections and generate reports and share information, uh, but also to get automated alerts for activity that they care about, whether that's a vehicle arriving after hours or potentially, you know, uh, pump jack not operating within normal parameters. And by using this combination of proactive alerts and remote site inspections and reporting, we've seen customers reduce routine site visits to the oil well by 50%. So we're not at that 100% that Jeffrey talked about, but we're on our way. Uh, and obviously there's environmental benefits too when you're rolling fewer trucks. Uh, you can reduce CO CO2 emissions significantly, and if you track those, there are credits available for that. One of the, uh, one of the uh, companies that I do some business with has said to me that one of the, one of the key values here is stress reduction. Um, operators going out to field to inspect some asset and don't know what they're going to see when they get out there yeah. is very stressful. It's hard on the families at home when, when you know mom or dad has to get up in the middle of the night and go dealing off, uh, go off and deal with some asset. And, and having some visualization about what's going on in the field takes all that stress away. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. That's consistent with what we've heard from our, our customers and the operators in the field. Yeah. Um, so we talked, we touched on you know kind of three things in terms of the benefits we deliver. One is operational efficiency or cost reduction. Second is uh, environmental monitoring. So our system can be used simply to inspect environmentally sensitive areas along a pipeline um, or potentially in wetlands, but you can also use our system to automatically detect um, methane emissions and other gas emissions. So an example here, our system was deployed uh, using thermal imaging connected to Osprey Reach to do analysis and alerts. Uh, it was used to monitor uh, the, the roofs of bitumen tanks to look for methane emissions to identify how many of the vents uh, actually popped. Uh, and then our customer used their system for two reasons. One is to report more accurately, but more importantly, they used our, our information that we're providing around the methane leaks to optimize the pressure in the piping to prevent future emissions. Uh, and based on doing this, our customer told us the system basically paid itself with a single emission. And then looking ahead, um, and you can, you can kind of track this over the next few months and eventually we'll do a webinar on it, we're developing a computer vision system that uses machine learning to look for very small amounts uh, of methane from a number of assets, and that'll be used primarily for autonomous uh, fugitive methane detection. So you can look for that coming from, from Osprey over the next several months. And then finally, you know, one of the traditional use cases is activity detection for, for visual uh, monitoring systems, and that obviously has a, a benefit in terms of theft and vandalism, but it can also be used to, uh, to monitor workers as they come and go from site, to match time on site against invoices. So when you have very accurate activity detection, which Osprey does, you can do a lot of things with that. Um, so we're able to, to accurately detect vehicles and people with the computer vision technology that we talked about. And by applying computer vision on top of the traditional motion-based analytics, we cut down on false positives by 85%. So what that means is we can actually deliver proactive alerts that are meaningful to people and are accurate. So you're not getting the false positives where eventually people just turn it off and ignore it. Um, so as a result, we've seen a deterrence in terms of theft of defense, in terms of theft attempts rather. Uh, our customers can receive proactive alerts for improved incident response, and our system has actually enabled customers to uh, to arrest multiple people uh, at uh, at their site. So being proactive, you have to be accurate. And to be accurate, you have to apply artificial intelligence to the massive amount of data that's coming in. And again, that can apply to security to fight theft and vandalism, or it can be applied applied to monitor. Uh, workers that are working alone or uh, tracking contractors as they come and go from your remote site. So I'm just going to sum up a bit about, uh, about Osprey and kind of where we fit uh, into Jeffrey's framework. So, you know, we do have a proven solution for digital transformation. We have deployed with more than 30 oil and gas customers uh, with, with a large number of use cases, uh, and certainly we'd be happy to provide more information on other use cases after the presentation. We have proven cost savings and risk mitigation benefits. So we've proven this out in the field. Um, by integrating with other sensors and systems that are relevant to industry uh, for alarm validation, you can get a better picture of what's going on and you can respond more effectively to incidents and alerts. And then finally, um, we are consistent with Jeffrey's How Digital Gets Done framework. So 
what I mean by that is we are managing a large number of connected devices in the field, so that's IoT. Uh, we use artificial intelligence or computer vision to analyze the data. And then we allow our customers to automate their processes using our system. So Jeffrey describes it as robotics, but fundamentally that's a type of, of automation. So, Perfect. so it means the same thing. And then it's all delivered over a cloud computing infrastructure. So we have that massive scalability to add cameras, add users, handle a massive amount of data, process all that data in the cloud. So you know, it's really interesting when we saw Jeffrey put that framework together, it really spoke to us, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to sit down with Jeffrey and, 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 do, this, uh, and do this webinar together, because we feel with it, our approaches are fitting nicely with Jeffrey's framework, and we're hitting a lot of the, the value proposition and indicators that he mentions. So on that note, um, that's the formal part of the presentation. And, um, and we, do have, uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. Uh, and feel free to submit more via the chat feature. We'll walk through as many as we get. Uh, and uh, on that note, I've got a couple questions that, uh, that we'll get started with. Uh, and if you have any more questions, obviously you can reach out to Jeffrey, reach out to myself. I've also given you Paul Ritchie, our head of sales, uh, his contact information here. So uh, just to go through some questions, a, a question for Jeffrey. Um, Osprey provided examples of digital success. Do you have other examples in oil and gas that have worked that you've seen? Um, outside of the visual world, um, specifically? Or yeah, yeah, I think that's outside, what the, the... Outside of visual. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots and lots of examples of, 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 of uh, technologies that I, I find um, offering tremendous benefit. I'll use an example from Australia. Um, if you watch uh, TV shows, you might have heard about the flying doctors. They fly around rural Australia and uh, provide health and medical services to remote stations. Uh, they land at little airports all over Australia. These are unmanned airports with um, you know, a little tank there with some airplane fuel. How do you know what's in the tank? And uh, there's, no, there's no telecommunications out there, so it might not even be power. Uh, but the tank is fuel is there. And so the operator in this case uh, has developed a very inexpensive gauge that sits inside the tank, and, and it uh, records the um, movement of uh, fuel in and out of the tank, uh, sends that up by uh, cloud computing to a satellite uplink. Um, it only connects up to the satellite for 12 seconds a day, just sends this tiny little sp uh, spurt of data. And uh, the operator has uh, visibility to exactly what's in the tank. They can tell whether it's being stolen, whether it's being sold, and, and how much volume is there so they know how to replenish. It's a fabulous use case. It would work perfectly here in Alberta because we have lots and lots of chemical tanks with um, volumes uh, constantly uh, uh, changing, and uh, technology like that could, uh, could save us a lot of time and money driving around visiting tanks that, that you know, don't need to be visited because we just don't know how much volume is in them. That's a good example. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's a great one. And a, a second one that, that seems to be directed at you, Jeffrey, can you expand a bit more on, on blockchain? And, and, and I think um, and it's, it's the opportunities in oil and gas for blockchain. And this is interesting. I think you probably do a whole webinar on this. It's a fairly complex <laughs> yeah. subject and certainly one that Osprey is diving into. But if you had a few comments, Jeffrey, on the applicability of blockchain in oil and gas. Yeah, so uh, blockchain, uh, if you think about what blockchain actually is, it's a distributed ledger technology. And, and so the way that the example I like to use is accounts payable and accounts receivable. Most companies have an accounts payable ledger where they have bills they need to pay, and they have an accounts receivable ledger where they have money they need to receive. The counterparty of my AP is someone's got an AR. That's a perfect example of a distributed ledger. Your one side of the transaction and is some other party's other side of the transaction. And what blockchain does is it creates, using cloud computing and encryption and several other clever technologies, puts that, that one set of data, my AP or AR, into a single um, shared ledger, which sits up in the cloud. And of course, it's encrypted and secure and so forth so that uh, others can't see it or tamper with it. But what that does is if, you can, if the two parties can agree that the AP and the AR uh, balance and are constantly balanced, in other words, no one side can make a change without the other one agreeing to it, you can eliminate the, the AP and AR from both sides and just have one shared. That is the promise of um, blockchain technology. And the, the number of use cases is extraordinary. The early adopters are finding, for instance, I'll use NAL as an example, uh, putting blockchain into their royalty contracts has t uh, eliminated disputes with their royalty holders. That was fully 8% of their, AR, uh, their uh, accounts payable and accounts receivable. They simply eliminated uh, this, this value. This is tens of millions of dollars. 
If we took the same symptom and applied it in Alberta for royalties alone, there's $2 billion of cash flow trapped on balance sheets everywhere that, that we can't get at because it's hung up in disputes. Um, so there's, there's a use case. You don't have to look too far. That's just a single example. There's hundreds of hundreds of others. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, there's a, a question here <coughs> um, around machine learning. So great presentation. I, I agree with the points raised. Thank you. Uh, one challenge worth addressing is the challenge that sometimes a company is making a business case around going digital, in particular applying machine learning. There are two broad categories of machine learning supervised and unsupervised, so potentially more coming. So, yeah, I'll, I'll comment on, on the applicability of machine learning based on, on our experience. So, you know, there are two types. One is supervised. So, in a supervised machine learning, you establish a, a set of training data, uh, and then you match incoming images against the training data and use that training data to, to improve the algorithm. So that is the bulk of what, uh, what is being done in terms of machine learning is supervised learning. And the challenge with supervised is you have to have the data. Uh, and you, you have to structure that data by ensuring that it's accurately tagged. And there's a lot of work and effort and potentially cost in doing that. And that's something that, uh, that Osprey has, um, has in, frankly invested a lot in is getting a, a, a large set of industrial images ensuring that they're all tagged properly, all structured, and using that to test and train algorithms and to fundamentally improve them. So that's structured, or sorry, that's supervised machine learning. And I think that's kind of the state of the art right now. Um, unsupervised machine learning is, is a much larger challenge because you, um, you don't have that structured uh, data that you're working off, off of, but that's, that's kind of the next step in machine learning. And I think that will, will make things more automated, more cost-effective to develop machine learning models and eventually what you'll have are algorithms, training algorithms, and no humans in the middle kind of in, ensuring that the AI is actually correct. So that, that's kind of how we see it. So we're focused on, on structured or supervised machine learning at this point. Um, and, uh, and down the road, though, we do see incredible opportunities for more automated machine learning. And as it becomes more automated, obviously the business case gets stronger. Hopefully that answers the question. Next one is um, relates to the part three of the uh, digital journey that I've sketched out. How do we convince oil and gas firms, and particularly larger firms, uh, that there is a business case um, in the uh, return on investment from any investments in machine learning? So a number of conditions have to be in place um, before uh, the the uh, investments or the roadmap can be uh, can be successful. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the two previous steps are are there for a reason. Uh, what is the digital North Star, and have you educated your organization? If you do those two things first, you won't have as much of a challenge getting the third step, which is the business-driven roadmap. The, the, uh, the experience in industry is that if you can align your executive, um, uh, executives at the top of these uh, oil and gas to see the value and promise of, our, of um, digital innovation, um, and you can bring the rest of the organization along for the journey, the education step, uh, the proof case in application of analytics and machine learning to oil and gas is much easier. If you jump right in, though, and say, hey, I want to start selling you analytics and machine learning in oil and gas, um, that's, a, that's a fraught journey. I've not seen that um, be very successful. So it, I think it starts with change management, getting your executives at the top of your organization aligned on the value promise of digital, and, uh, and then your journey is much more straightforward. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, just a couple more questions, I think, that, uh, that we'll go through here. One is, um, can you use drones or drone footage for pipeline inspections also? And secondarily, what sort of communications are needed? Uh, I assume this, this question is directed at Osprey, so I'll address that. So starting with drones, um, you know, ultimately what we want Osprey Reach to be is the platform that takes in all the visual data from an enterprise and structures it, whether that data is from fixed cameras, which is the bulk of our installations today, or whether that's from smartphones, or whether that's from drones. So our strategy with drones will be to take on that drone data, structure it, potentially perform additional analytics in the cloud, and make that available to whoever needs it through our alerts and, uh, and reports across the organization, which is different than what you see with a typical drone deployment where the data is kind of siloed within the organization and not made into an enterprise asset. Um, so that's something that, that we're working on today, and we're actually in contact with a couple of drone companies on that front. Um, the second question is, what sort of communications do you need uh, for your system? So we typically deploy over cellular. Uh, you know, as, as an IoT solution, we need to be bandwidth efficient. That allows us to cost-effectively deploy over cellular networks, 
outside of corporate IT infrastructure. So we don't have to deal with firewall issues and we can deploy more quickly. Uh, and we don't have to, um, we don't have to engage IT and take up a lot of their time to deal with their network. So again, by deploying over cellular, um, we have a pretty significant advantage there. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, the one down below, this one is, and uh, uh, one of the implications of uh, digital is uh, digital talent. Do we actually have the talent necessary? Um, and this, the question is, do we have enough people knowledgeable in data science as an enabler or a precondition to the broader ecosystem in Alberta to drive this? And uh, so uh, if we just unpack this a little bit, um, do we have enough people knowledgeable in data science? Um, no. Uh, the, the, there are already a uh, number of job openings in Calgary uh, for data sciences uh, uh, type roles that our uh, companies are struggling to fill. And uh, Calgary Economic Development went to Vancouver just uh, two or three weeks ago on a mission to try and recruit uh, data scientists, that, uh, uh, individuals trained in data science, to consider relocating to Alberta. So the short answer is no. On the, on the positive side, though, both the University of Calgary and SAIT um, and probably Mount Royal too, I, I don't know for sure, uh, uh, have recognized that the demand in the community is now moving towards uh, the, the need to fulfill uh, data science type uh, understanding methods and so forth deep into the curriculum for our more traditional uh, disciplines like, like engineering and environmental sciences and so forth. So uh, the next generation of workers coming up are going to have data science built right into their courses. Uh, so unfortunately, we have this. We're going to have, have to rely on outsourcing and and, uh, uh, and consultants and advisors to step up. Uh, but in in the fullness of time, uh, this problem will correct itself as it always typically does. The market will uh, signal to the the educational institutions to start training the right people for the skills that we need for the future. Yeah, and that's a good point, Jeffrey. And in our case, we have been able to connect with a number of research institutes in Alberta and and across Canada and also outside of Canada and the U.S that are doing uh, some pretty amazing work in, in computer vision uh, and leveraging their research. So, you know, the, the networking opportunities are out there, but you have to have a broad perspective and, and find out who's doing what uh, and make those connections and find the applicability to solve actual problems for your, for your customers. Um, I, I think we're just about done. Any other questions coming through there? No? I think we're good. So uh, if there are no other questions here at the last minute, uh, I think we'll wrap things up. So. Uh, on that note, just to, just to sum up, you know, we really appreciate Jeffrey Kahn uh, coming in and spending time with us today and, and, and sharing his thoughts. I, I think it was extremely insightful. Um, we do have uh, a number of use cases, more information and demos available if you're interested in Osprey Reach uh, and, and how we can help uh, empower oil and gas companies to transform their operations. So feel free to reach out. And also keep an eye open for, uh, for additional webinars from Osprey. You can check out our website. We'll try to do these on a regular basis, approximately once a month, uh, and we'll just keep the momentum going with this webinar series. We do have one last question. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. one last question came in at the last second. So, so I will walk through that, and then we'll wrap things up. So are we asking oil and gas companies to become IT telecom companies as part of the journey? Or consistent with your fourth and fifth points, is it really partners in the ecosystem that should deliver this? In other words, oil and gas companies need the data, but as it follows, they need to be the ones that build the value chain to collect that data. So, I, you know, Jeffrey, you're naughty. You've got some thoughts. I'll just have thoughts there. I, I don't think uh, oil and gas companies want to become telecom companies. Um, this is part of, for Osprey, it's part of our managed service to deliver the telecommunication connectivity, to set it up on a private network, and to, uh, to maintain that, and basically to bundle that as part of our, our whole solution. So it's really nothing to do on the customer side in terms of managing telecoms. So that's been our approach, and we think that's a much easier, a much easier sell and a much easier installation, much better for the customer. Um, Jeffrey, any, any points on uh, your end? Well, I think it does, it, uh, I'm not sure who put this, uh, who submitted the question, but uh, there's an there's a interesting data point for us to, to sort of think about. The most recent wireless spectrum auction uh, um, uh, included uh, Canadian Natural Resources Limited as one of the bidders. Right. You know, so you have to ask the question, why would a big oil company be bidding for wireless spectrum? Right. And, um, and so the, the answer is, uh, you know, one, it's a hedge, but, you know, CNRL pretty shrewd people with their money. Uh, I think the reality is um, that CNRL is looking at the need for telecommunications infrastructure across the parts of North America uh, where they've got operations in Canada where the telcos are not um, is um, highly motivated to um, invest. 
Yeah, quite frankly, if you're a telecom, you want to invest your money where you're going to sell lots and lots of bandwidth type services. So yeah. you're going to be you're going to be sta standing up telecom infrastructure and housing developments, not in remote oil fields. So so it w I found it very interesting that CNRL did uh, step in to be a bidder. They withdrew their bid, um, as it turns out. Um, but uh, you know, it isn't important. To, you're raising a really important point. Um, in my view, it is up to the ecosystem to do this. It should not be up to oil and gas companies. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing. You know, there are a couple companies that I should call out here. One is Infrastructure Networks in the U.S. It's building LT networks across uh, all the key operating areas for oil and gas in the U.S. So that's a company that, uh, you know, can really enable uh, the deployment of, of IoT uh, and, and cellular connectivity without that being managed by, by customers. And then you have enabling technologies like Expedo that can create private LTE networks very easily through software um, that can also help companies manage these. So on that note, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, we do appreciate all the questions. Uh, and we, we will be making the recording of this webinar and the information available to all of us. Uh, you'll be receiving an email with more information about how to access that. And we'll also be posting on our website.